Greetings class and welcome back to another session for uh, learning about PSYOP. Today we're going to be talking about strategies, which is uh, coming mostly out of this book here that we're using in this class, uh, uh, Making Content Comprehensible, the PSYOP model. Um, it is a rather good book. It's rather simple. Uh, I believe in future I'm going to make it as a recommended book. Uh, you should be able to get a lot of this information offline. And as I said before, this comes more from an educational background, less from a linguistics background, more from a U.S. education instead of a um, um, second language, uh, foreign, uh, foreign language, overseas type of uh, language uh, background. It's good material, and uh, today we're going to look at st uh, strategies. We're going to look at PSYOP strategies. This is their breakdown regarding uh, some of the things that you're supposed to be doing here. We're going to be uh, looking at uh, the strategies and scaffolding and higher order thinking skills. And those are the main areas that uh, they focus on in here that we should be incorporating strategies into our teaching so that students can become independent learners. A brilliant idea. I'm not brilliant. Excellent idea. Um, every teacher who is teaching language should always be trying to find ways to incorporate these uh, learning strategies so that students can become independent learners and they don't need us. And so that's what we're going to be looking at uh, today. Um, reasons for uh, uh, strategies. Well, we want to be able to help students select the right strategies they need to help them learn language. And depending on the activity that you're doing, you may have a variety of different uh, activities, uh, strategies that you may want to use. I uh, oftentimes, for example, enjoy a circumlocution. I don't know if you remember what circumlocution means. But that means when you come to a word or phrase that you don't understand, you try to talk your way around it. Try to give uh, a description of something. Uh, the example I typically use is when I talk to students and I say, you know, that uh, I wanted to buy um, that little animal, you know, with the long ears and the kind of uh, uh, short, uh, kind of fluffy tail. He likes to hop around, okay? That's kind of, and then the other person is going to say to me, oh, you mean uh, a rabbit, right? And so... That's the kind of way that you would do scaffolding. Now, that's one strategy I can use in order to elicit information from from the person I'm talking to. And when I was living overseas, I did that a lot. I didn't know a word. I would try to give an explanation so they would give me the word. I remember the first time I walked into a bank when I was living in Japan, and I wanted to open an account. And I walked in, and I said, I'd like to, and I realized I didn't know what the word account was. So I had to do something. So I explained to them, I want to put money into the bank. I want to put... I want to put money here. And they said, oh, you want to open an account? They said it in Japanese. I'm like, oh, that's right. And then I learned that new word. It was a strategy that I used. Now, that strategy, does strategy, strategy doesn't always work. There are times where uh, you need to elicit other types. So the first thing you want to do if you're going to be teaching a class and you want to try to incorporate strategies, you want to identify which ones are going to be ideal for teaching. This is a great learning opportunity for them to learn this strategy. So pick those out. And every, every time you're going to make new lessons and you want to incorporate a strategy, you should try to find another one. Uh, some people I know, they keep a list of them on the wall so that they can remember what these strategies are and they can try to incorporate them. Again, that's the goal here, to create independent learners. So we want to select appropriate strategies. Then we want to incorporate metacognitive information and practice uh, into the lesson plans. Okay, So we want to get them to be thinking about these things and figuring out how they can think about how to use the strategies. Right? I'm going to talk about some uh, scaffolding techniques and then uh, um, have some procedures for uh, putting them into, uh, into uh, classrooms. Okay. First of all, there are a number of types of um, learning strategies. And uh, just to give you an example here, they, they list uh, three major ones here, your metacognitive, cognitive, and then socio-affective. Socio uh, these are the ones that they've listed, and I'm just going to run through them rather quickly here. They, have, they talk about metacognitive strategies, self-monitoring. So when you're looking at something or learning something, you can monitor yourself. Is this what, the way I wanted to say this? Is this what this really is? Did I really say that properly? Again, you're saying things and you're listening to yourself. You're listening to others. You're thinking about things as you go. Uh, Self-questioning. What is the purpose of this? You're asking yourself this okay, as a language learner. What's the purpose of this piece of reading, for example? Or what's the purpose of this lecture? And you're asking yourself this in order to help you try to figure out what it is uh, that this information is, right? You may self-clarify. Oh, that's we just talked about that. Self-clarifying the purpose. You may ask yourself questions. You know, what what is the main idea? What is you know what is this? Why is this here? You're asking yourself questions to help you 
again, try to figure out uh, what the what the answer is. Um, I, I again, I go back to my idea about using uh, circumlocution, and I knew that there were times where it wasn't working, and so I had to switch strategies. Well, the only way I could know that is if I was self monitoring. Okay, I would realize, okay, this idea is not working. I'm not getting the information that I need to help me learn, and so I'd have to switch to a different strategy. And you know, there are a number that I can do, but that's this whole idea of uh, questioning and monitoring as you go along. Uh, the book also mentions uh, cognitive strategies, uh, things that you can do uh, logically to help you identify and understand what's going on. Things like previewing. So before you go and read, whatever it is, you preview. You look for your main ideas, you look for your headings, your pictures, your graphs, uh, and you want to show your students this, how to do, use this strategy so they can get a, a big picture of what's going on before they delve into the text, right? Trying to identify the reading purpose, right? Right. To locate where that purpose is. Every language is is different, by the way, with where they put those things. Um, so, trying to connect reading to your own personal background information, and if you can do that, it's going to help you. Um, when I was living uh, overseas, oftentimes I would be asked to, to translate uh, for people who were speaking at churches, and because I know. Uh, Bible fairly well. There were times where I wasn't clear what the pastor or the speaker was saying, but then that person would, would start referencing a passage and everything would click into place because I had that background information. Okay, So if I can connect that, it's going to help me learn and understand the purpose of things faster. Again, that's another tool I can use. Note taking. Okay, You're hearing things, but as you start taking notes, you're starting to organize and that's going to help you uh, learn and understand that information. Doing a graphic organizer, same type of thing. If you can do that with the material that's coming through, you'll be able to organize and understand what's going on better. Then there are socio-affective uh, um, strategies that you can do. You can do group work. You can ask other people. Um, the uh, the the uh, oh, I forget the name of the method. Um, there's a method where you actually go out and the lamp method. I'm sorry, that's what it is. The lamp method, where you go and you elicit information, you elicit help from uh, contacts. Uh, and you try to get them to help you. Or you're working within your own group and you have people helping you. This iron sharpens iron type of idea. This group can help you clarify and understand the things uh, that you need to learn in order to complete whatever project it is you're doing. So there, are, those are the ones that they're talking about in, in the book. There are a number of strategies. Um, if you look at your cognitive strategies, there are a whole bunch of them that uh, I don't know that they were listed in here. Um, but there are things that you can do, and we'll get to them in just a second, but there are lots of things that you can do to help um, students grasp and, and uh, make sure that they understand the meaning of what's going on in whatever text or uh, listening that you're, that you're, that you're doing. Uh, the text also talks about a, uh, a continuum of strategies. In other words, uh, as they said, there are strategies that are more teacher-centric, where the teacher is doing... Uh, things to help you, and then there are teacher-assisted things. And so uh, strategies for lectures and instruction. In other words, you're just receiving information. You're not doing anything but just trying to capture that information. And then there are strategies uh, for that. There are strategies for a teacher-assisted, where the teacher gives you some information, and then you have to go on and uh, participate. Okay, that's uh, they've listed here things like drilling, drills, brainstorming. Uh, discussion groups, uh, discovery learning, where the teacher gives you some information, then you have to go in and, and uh, provide more. You have to go in and do uh, the lion's share of the work. There's peer-assisted group work. Um, my opinion, group work in classes is a tremendous plus. It helps them lower the affective filter. They can help one another. Iron sharpens iron. And they can also uh, glean strategies from one another as well. Um, so last one here is uh, self um, assisted, self-centered uh, strategies, things like note-taking, reflecting, again, thinking about what's going on, and then organizing. Um, you'll find a lot more of these in other places. Uh, so, I mean, these are by no means the only ones that are here, uh, but they're the ones that they were listed. Uh, the text also talked about language learning strategies, and there are many of these. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, that you can find in a variety of places. Uh, one that they've listed here are, is mnemonics, uh, which I don't often use, but you can make a word out of something. You know, when people say, uh, you know, what are the, what are the the uh, lines on the uh, G, G cleft, G G uh, score, you know, and it's every good boy does fine, and you learn every good boy does fine, and you know the, 
you know the the uh, lines, you know, and the spaces. I think is F A C E face. And uh, again, just to help you memorize mnemonics. There are a variety of rehearsal strategies. Uh, ones that they've mentioned here, I believe, are um, things like S Q P R S or squeepers, and it's a variety of things that you do in order to learn them. These include uh, doing um, what are these surveys, and then you can ask questions. So you're trying to survey the information, do a quick preview, and then you can ask questions. You can predict. You can then read and respond and then summarize. So all that put together is squeepers. Um, and that's just a way of helping you learn what's going on within the process. You can try to figure out the gist. <coughs> um, you can use graphic organizers to help you learn. Again, you're trying to organize uh, the information so that it'll help you understand what's going on. You may want to be breaking it down, you know, the beginning, middle, and end type of thing, or whatever the parts are to help you understand. There are comprehension strategies. Um, um, ways that you can be asking questions in order to figure out what's going on. Obviously, you're going to want to try to find out the, the, you know, the who, what, when, where, why type of thing. Uh, there's something in here called uh, the directed reading, which is uh, thinking reading, as as uh, as they call it. Uh, the example here was that you're reading, but in the middle of the reading, you know, you're telling you're reading this kid's a story or whatnot. And in the middle of reading, you stop and you say, "Okay, what's happening? What's going to happen? What do you think is going to happen?" You're getting them to try to think about uh, the possibilities of what's going to be coming up. Um, and uh, so that's the directed uh, directed thinking activity. Um, they also talked about the color uh, approach, which is uh, another system of language learning. It's another theory or method, uh, cognitive academic language learning approach, and there are a number of um, uh, components to this. And if you're interested, you can go look at some of my other videos regarding uh, the color approach. Uh, it's an excellent system, much more linguistically based than this one is. And uh, so we're, we're not going to add any more to that here. Um, in this section on scaffold uh, on uh, strategies, um, they, the authors also talk about uh, some scaffolding techniques, ways that you can help um, students understand by giving them some kind of some kind of support. One would be paraphrasing, um, as they're trying to understand a passage of text. If they can or you can paraphrase it for them, then when they go to read it uh, or when they go to listen to it, it's going to be easier for them to understand. Uh, and they can use that on their own tip that there they can I'll start again they can use this technique to help themselves as they're trying to learn uh, the text or materials that they're going there's the uh, think alouds which is uh, similar to um, similar to the directed reading as we were looking at before and this is where students as they're uh, reading and or doing any questions that they have they're saying them out loud kind of like this uh, a verbal self-reflection type of thing and uh, and they're trying to verbalize these things as they go along to try to help them figure out what points they need to help them figure out what uh, elements that they're missing in order to completely understand the material that's going on uh, they also talk about reinforcing um, contextual clues there are in all texts uh, lots of clues to help you understand what words are and uh, you can emphasize those, whether you're highlighting or underlining, to let them know that those definitions or explanations or clues are embedded in the, in the uh, material, whether it's a, a, a reading or a listening uh, type of thing. And so they can learn to do that themselves if they understand what those strategies are, what those techniques are, what those materials are that's embedded. Uh, most students don't realize that a lot of times when they a new word is introduced, the definition is also there. So you can help them see what that is. It's going to uh, make it easier for them to learn. <clears throat> they also mentioned some other ways to provide scaffolding. One is to slow speech, increase pauses, and to begin speaking in phrases. Now, although I understand why they're doing this, uh, I don't know that I necessarily agree um, because then students will be used to hearing people talk like this. Um, I know for from personal experience, I was uh, attending a group, uh, a weekly group meeting when I was living in Japan, and the pastor spoke 
very slowly. That was just his personality. And it did not take me very long before I could understand most of what he was saying. Um, but he always spoke slowly. And uh, again, I got used to that. However, the moment someone else came to come and speak and they spoke at normal speed, I was lost. So it may be that it was a quote-unquote help for me to understand early. It didn't help me listen to the majority of people. Um, so uh, my thought here is to keep it at normal speed. That doesn't mean that you don't repeat if you need to. You'll repeat it again and again if you have to. But it would be better for them to hear it at normal speeds uh, without the pauses so that they can understand. Now, if there is no understanding going on, you're going to have to do something. You may have to slow down, but I wouldn't do this as a general policy. Keep it at normal speed. As I tell my students, if you can understand me, you're going to be able to understand anybody. So I try to articulate, but I don't want to slow down my speech because I don't want to have them become handicapped on the level of language. Okay. So this idea here, I don't know that I necessarily agree, but I understand why they're why they were suggesting it. In addition to the uh, scaffolding and the uh, the variety of um, of strategies that they mentioned, um, the authors here also talk about uh, the need to include strategies to promote higher order thinking. Uh, this is pretty much done. Um, anywhere in the United States now where they want to promote not only uh, the learning of language but the, the ability to think critically uh, about the material that's being the material that's being covered and uh, the authors mentioned two two uh, ranges two two uh, well, uh, psychologists and their knee and their uh, breakdown of uh, of uh, language learning objectives. One is Bloom's uh, Educational Objectives, and one is uh, Crothwell's Taxonomy for Learning and Teaching uh, and Assessing. Um, each of these has a variety of activities that you can do uh, within them. Bloom's uh, begins with knowledge, where you can understand the basic information, but then comprehending is uh, taking that information and, you, and understanding it in uh, m more of its detailed and, and whole overarching type of uh, information. And then you've got to take that information and how can you apply it, and then you can take that information and how you can analyze it, what was good, what was bad, what was right, what was wrong, do you agree or disagree? Synthesizing, trying to take all of the information that you have and try to try to put them together. You may have two pieces of information that are um, uh, w that you try to put together, right? You can do evaluations of um, information, okay? And again, this requires more of that critical thinking, um, okay? And then Crothwell's was the same type of thing, you know, remembering and how you remember. Uh, can you recall it? Can you recognize it? And then understanding it. And can you actually understand it? Can you, uh, for example, can you interpret? Can you break it down into smaller parts? Can you, uh, can you uh, summarize it? You know? And then, of course, applying that information. Okay, now you know this. What can you do with it? Can you execute some type of um, action with that type of thing? Again, we go back to analyzing and evaluating. Can we analyze it? Can we critique it? What was good, bad? Uh, you know, what was what was interesting or not interesting? How did this help you or not help you? Okay, and then evaluating, and then finally uh, creating. Can I take this information and create something else with it? Um, so these are more of your higher order thinking uh, uh, skills, and then of course the associated strategies with them, um, as far as uh, language learning is concerned. Um, you do see um, higher order thinking skills, critical thinking, which is the typical word used in second language uh, teaching, uh, teaching a second language. You, you hear about critical, uh, critical thinking and encouraging students to do that. Um, again, that's not necessarily a language-based thing, but it is certainly a cognitive, logical-based thing. Uh, and I certainly means that the language learning is more interesting. You're not just merely focusing on language. Um, anyway, that's chapter five out of the sci out of uh, this text that we're using. If you do have questions or problems, please let me know. Um, make sure that you put your notes up online and have a nice day. Talk to you later.